Regional variants were first introduced in Alola, probably as a way to appeal to older people, like myself, who are still partial to Kanto. After all, everyone knows that Kanto Pokémon are the best. Just look at these incredibly designed Pokémon. For this hardcore Nuzlocke, I've decided to play through Pokémon Ultra Moon using only the Alolan variants. Some are pretty awesome, and some have crappy abilities. But I hope to be able to use all of them at least a little bit. Are they strong enough to help me become Alola's first champion? Before we find out, which Alolan variant is your favorite? Mine is obviously Ninetales, because look at that beautiful beast. For this run, I call myself Lilo for obvious reasons. Don't be fooled by this deep, manly voice. Lilo is very much a girl. Haven't you seen the movie? After watching an explosive cutscene, the game officially begins as I am woken up by a lame old Meowth. Not sure why my mom keeps this Cantonian one around, since we have much better ones here. I may have just come from Kanto, but for some reason, I feel like Alola is where I've belonged my entire life. This kid right outside my house taunts me with her dark Meowth and sings a pretty crappy educational song. Don't quit your day job there, kid. Three Pokemon save me from a rat attack, and I'm grateful, but at the same time, these things are not Alolan forms of Kanto Pokemon, so who cares? I guess I'll take the Litten. He looks cute enough. <gasps> and then another kid taunts me with their Meowth. How gets to pick one of the reject starters and forces me to use Hyole. Your rival goes easy on you, so I quickly take out his Rowlet. This island deity is apparently pretty violent, just throwing out thunderstorms left and right, which only encourages children to act out so they can see it. Maybe threatening them with violence isn't the best idea. After all, violence should be reserved for Pokemon battles. On the Mahalo Trail, another loser has an Alolan Meowth. Where the heck is mine? This is the third one. I've never realized how many of these things were in the early game until I couldn't get one. I help this lady in white get back her clearly oppressed Pokemon. After all, she shoves it into a gym bag and begs me not to tell anyone. Why not just use a little Pokeball like the rest of us? It's much more humane. Back in town, I meet the big kahuna, pun intended, as this girl continues her abuse but apparently we all think it's hilarious. After the prof teaches me how to catch Pokemon, like I haven't been doing it my whole life, I am finally able to look for a Meowth. Or not. You see, Meowths, and Rattatas, are only found at night. And I didn't know this, but apparently this section of the game is still considered the tutorial, and there are no day-night cycles. Which took me a while to figure out. So even armed with Pokeballs, I still get no Alolan forms. Super lame. I have another rival battle that I'm just going to skip. After the events of the Pokemon Lab, time finally begins to flow normally, meaning I can head back to my house and get an Alolan Rat. Unfortunately, Iole has Hustle, lowering her accuracy, so, you know, that's great for a Nuzlocke. A Tauros forces me to go to school, you're not my dad, but it's alright because I encounter another wonderful Alolan variant, in the form of Meowth, and Popoki actually has a good ability in Technician, powering up his weaker moves. It's a way better ability than Hustle, even if he is adamant, which is not quite the nature I would have chosen. I defeat a couple of kids, and their teacher too. She was way easier than in my last run. Upon leaving the school, Big Kahuna forces me to touch his Tauros to get by. That sounded weird. After practicing saying hi a few times, I play a lamer version of Pokemon Snap, and go all in with my pink outfit. I'm only 11. Give me a break. My third encounter ends up being a Grimer named Kele. For those of you keeping track, all three of my Pokemon are Dark type, so the first Kahuna battle is gonna be fun. Before that, I need to chase away some Team Skull losers. Ilima then wants me to take the pre-trial trial to see if I'm good enough for the actual thing. Papoki easily defeats the Young Goose without taking any damage, but the Smeargle hits like a truck. I was not expecting that. So, Kele makes his debut, and after poisoning Smeargle, swaps to Iole to stall, or to just use Quick Attack. That works too. I am again forced to interact with the Tauros, this time full on grabbing its spiky head pointy things. Doesn't seem like the best idea to me. Anyway, this has gone on far too long, let's jump to the first real trial, where I basically need to play Whack-A-Mole. Team Skull tries to stop me, but are inadvertently useful. As I try to take out this conveniently placed crystal, I'm attacked by a fat gumshoes with a defense boost. Because life just isn't fair. Popoki starts with a fake out, which doesn't stop the totem from calling an ally. That would have been nice. He successfully takes out the little young goose, but has been slowed down and has minus two defense. Kele comes out to immediately use his berry and disables gumshoes tackle. 
It may not seem like much, but with that, the battle is basically in the bag. Now the only attacking moves he has are Bite and Super Fang. This puts Kele in a great position to deal some real damage. After all, he resists Bite. Eventually he gets too low, I swap to Iole as the Disable wears off, and I hope that Bite actually hits, and it does, in spite of Hustle. That went pretty well, actually, all thanks to Disable. The first trial is finally over. This gives me the normal MZ, which I will certainly use in future battles. But first, I'm forced to watch this weirdo dance. And if you want to watch more of my videos, subscribe, leave a like, and comment. Every little bit helps. And I promise, I won't do any dancing. No one wants to see that. After a bit of searching, I find a very Alolan Diglett, who just so happens to be Steel-type. Well, that would have been useful in the last totem. Elima introduced himself for the third time and uses his full authority as a trial leader to move some fences. Wow! Talk about power. I am forced to save this little Pokemon again and have another How battle. Popoki makes short work of Rowlet with a couple of technician boosted bites, and the Noibat falls too. His Pikachu goes toe to head with Eli, the Diglett, who only knows Mud Slap. Fun stuff. After several slaps, Eli wins. It may seem like things are too easy, but don't you worry, that's about to change. You see, most of my Pokemon are dark, who are weak to fighting. And Eli, who is steel, is also weak to fighting. I mean, Kele is poison, so fighting is neutral, but there is no way he can solo the entire Kahuna battle. Instead, let's get a Pichu. He isn't quite a Lolan yet, but I don't think I can do this without him. I prevent Awila from evolving until level 13 so he can learn Nasty Plot. And after evolving, he learns Electro Ball too. This should be all I need to win, with a little bit of luck. Hala starts with a Machop, and I with a charming Uila. Then comes the Nasty Plots as Machop focuses his energy. One crit wouldn't be the end here, but multiple obviously would. After surviving the hit and healing with a berry, Machop falls to an Electro Ball. Makuhita has Fake Out, so it's a good thing that Awila still has some HP left. Regardless, Electro Ball takes him out too, and the Crab Brawler never gets a chance to use his Z-Move, which is great because it could have one-shot anyone on my team. I'm glad Awila made it out alive. If he hadn't, my backup plan, well, I don't want to spoil it just yet. I'll use that for the next trial. Now my first Grand Trial is complete. It took a while to get there, but things should hopefully pick up from here. After a while of searching, I finally steal Black Sludge from a Wild Grimer. I'm allowed to use Butterfree here because it's not a real fight and Compound Eyes just makes this go faster. Turns out that Professor Oak also has an Alolan variant named Samson. I go back and forth surfing on a manatee until I break the surfing record and get a ton of battle points. I'll be using these fairly frequently throughout the run. After taking another Z Crystal, a random lady corners me to show off her dance moves. What is with these people? In the next city, I meet Dexio and Sina, who are from the Kalos region, but I don't really remember them. Give me a break. I've played X like one time, I don't remember every weirdo who crosses my path. Those weirdos do let Popoke evolve though, so that's nice. I get an Adrenaline Orb, and with that, backtrack all the way to my house. I'm looking for a Pichu again, who I hit with an Adrenaline Orb, and that makes him calls for allies non-stop. Eventually, Butterfree is able to steal a Light Ball from the 5th Pikachu ally? That wasn't so bad. And speaking of Pikachu, I take mine to the Pikachu Valley to meet with his Pika friends. But after 5 Pika seconds, the novelty wears off and now we're just staring at each other. In the ranch town, Hao wants another battle, but it goes basically the same as the last one. Popoki takes out the Dartrix, this time Eli has magnitude for the Pikachu, and he Metal Claws the Noibat. Last is Eevee, whom my Lightball Pikachu makes short work of. Not too shabby. I save an Alola Vulpix from Team Skull, and would certainly not have done so for a regular Fire one. Non-Alolan Pokemon are about as useful as this Miltank who is being forced to flirt with a Tauros. I steal someone's egg from the nursery, and this will be relevant very soon. For now, I can't progress in the story because of two Soto Wudos and, mainly, a really dumb kid. You see, he's complaining that the path is blocked, but if he just moved over a tiny bit, I could easily get through. Jerk face. This makes me go north where I'm ambushed by Gladian. I beat him easily enough, with the exception of Type Null, who survives an Electro Ball when I thought he wouldn't. And he, you know, almost defeats Awila. That was too close for comfort. Here, I learn my first Alolan saying, that I'm sure everybody uses all the time. If the Murkrow are crying, it's time to be flying. I'm not sure what's making the Murkrow cry, but 
that's not the point. Here, Iole evolves, and I run around on my dog for a while, till this egg hatches into an Eevee. As awesome as this guy is, I really only need him as leverage to get a Thunderstone from the nursery people. So, Uwila is now officially an Alolan variant. Unfortunately, this means that I spent more time looking for a light ball than I actually did using it. Well, that sucks, but this is an Alolan specific run. I need to evolve my non-Alolan Pokemon as soon as possible. With that, I can start the second trial. And this one is quite terrifying, because I hate spiders, even if they only have six legs. Kele takes a ton from Bubble and poisons the bug, which was not actually necessary. He is replaced by Iole, who has the normal MZ. Hustle still gives her an attack boost, but breakneck speed cannot miss, so she gets all the benefit here and none of the drawback. It takes the fake spider right out. Then out comes Wheela to mop up the little bug. Aranquinid had a berry to reduce electric damage, by the way, or else I would have led with this guy. And the second trial is complete. That wasn't too bad. Back to this loser kid creating a problem where there ain't one. I scare off the fake trees with a bit of water, and this lets me get to the best store ever, where they just hand out 50% off coupons to every dumb kid who wanders in. Then, on the volcano, I catch myself a Cubone. She is another Pokemon who isn't a Lolan yet, but will be after a few totems, assuming she survives that long. My incredible manatee surfing pays off, as I can afford an ability capsule. Now, as much as I'd love to use this to get rid of Iole's hustle, it's much more important that Popoki have a fur coat. After all, this ability cuts physical damage in half. To put it bluntly, it's freaking incredible. The third trial tests my ability to watch Dancing Marowak, and that's basically it. For the pre-totem fights, I leave with Nalala and quickly swap into Iole to defeat these Pokemon. I need my Cubone healthy for the real fight, where the totem Marowak gets a double speed boost. Fun. He also immediately gets a crit, because of course he does. Still, her thief is not only super effective, but it steals the Marowak's thick club, cutting his attack in half. Unfortunately, I need to swap already because of that crit, and I bring out Iole on a flame burst and a flame wheel. Here, I failed to realize how much slower a Alolan Raticate is compared to the normal one, and she straight up gets taken out. I kind of assumed she was going to be sacrificed here anyway, but I hoped she would deal some damage first. Out comes Popoki to water Z-move the Fire Lizard, who still survives, and poisons him. Fun. Next turn, it falls though. After doing a bit of damage, I pivot to Kele on another Brick Break, who has his Black Sludge to heal, as well as Protect. I don't care if it's lame, I'm doing it. Flame Wheel still does a lot, the Club or not, and the Marowak almost falls to a bite. Expecting another Brick Break, my Psychic Rat comes out on a Detect, and finishes the battle. For my victory, I get the Ride Pager for Charizard, which is by far the most useful Ride Pokemon in the game. And I'm not just saying that because he's Charizard. Before continuing on with the story, it's time to permabox Iole. I feel bad basically just using her as a sacrifice, but she is by far the least useful Pokemon on my team. I already have a much better Dark type after all. I barge into Gladian's hotel room, but he is not very talkative. To be fair, I'd probably say the same thing if some kid wandered into my house. There's not really much else going on, so let's jump to the next trial, shall we? This trial leader is Mallow, who very shortly will be in the Mario RPG remake. Kind of a weird cameo if you ask me. Anyway, I steal some food from these Pokemon, and these so-called friends do nothing as a giant mantis sneaks up right behind me. This thing could have taken my head off. Kele starts with a Poison Fang, hoping for either Toxic from the move or poison from his ability. And it's toxic. Nice. Comfey brings out the sun, and Kele hits an infestation to deal some extra damage every turn. He uses Protect, trying to get the Mantis to just fall, but to no avail. Instead, anticipating a heal, Popoki comes out with a super weak fake out, letting the Comfey heal him. This isn't quite working out how I'd hoped, but that's okay, I can still do this. I swap to Eli the Diglet on not an X Scizor, and he obviously doesn't make it. That was unfortunate. Just two levels before he evolved too. Wheela does not outspeed and barely survives a solar blade. This could have easily been a wipe. After Psychic and Toxic, Lorantis finally keels over. Man, that was rough. Kelly returns to finish off the Comfey, by the way. I may have completed this trial, but I barely even got a chance to use Eli before his untimely demise. This run is starting to take a turn for the worst. Speaking of, here is the prof's wife, who is also a prof. 
talk about a power couple. We try to talk smack about Hal behind his back, but he was apparently just hiding behind the wall listening. All right, you creep. We learn about this super rare phenomenon called an ultra wormhole that I doubt I'll ever get to see. Didn't you hear me say it's super rare? After that physics lesson, I am forced to go through Diglett Tunnel and relive the trauma I just experienced. Because there are Diglett galore here, and they all remind me of Eli. He was taken from us too soon. So, I take out my frustration on Team Skull at the end of Diglett Tunnel, where I meet up with Looker, who, for the very first time, doesn't just blurt out his secret profession. I guess he's learning. And this police officer learns that his partner was actually a ditto in disguise. The real guy was apparently just sick for a while and never called in to work? That's unprofessional. I accept the cop's hush money to keep this whole thing quiet and get a probopass letter. I didn't know you could read. No, I didn't mean that as an insult. Come back. In the Plumeria battle, Popoki gets a chance to redeem himself by hydro vortexing the lizard baby and it actually one shots this time. Life hack for you. If you're having a problem beating up a fully grown lizard, just find the youngins instead. Works for Popoki. Uh, Fooey? I'm sure you have better curses than that, goth girl. With that, Nalala evolves and is now a wonderful Alola Pokemon. The second Grand Kahuna, Olivia, is not so grand as the big guy, but she still might be formidable. Nalala takes out her Anorith with a few flame charges after Olivia wastes a heal. I swap to Kelly on the Lilip to take Ancient Power and heal with some sludge. He stalls a bit, and I'm hoping that Lilip doesn't get too many Omni Boosts here. One would be okay, but even that doesn't happen. Right as Kelly's about to deal double damage with Venoshock though, Olivia full heals to make it suck. Oh well. She gets poisoned again, and runs out of Ancient Power, so it's time for Wheela to come in on a pathetic brine. He uses Nasty Plot, and then Psychic. That special attack boost, combined with a Grassy MZ Grass Knot, is more than enough to one-shot Lycanroc. I didn't really want to give him a chance to use his Z-move. A reward for winning the second Grand Trial is, you guessed it, a dance show. It doesn't do anything to me, but was apparently super effective against Lily. I may not have been taken in by Olivia's mesmerizing dance, but when this creepy looking dude tells me all about this Aether Palace place, I'm all in. After all, he's an adult who keeps his word, so what could go wrong? Hao also gets roped into this somehow, so it's two for the price of one. Faba pawns us off into Wiki, whose job is to try to pry information out of us, something Hao does very willingly. He finally realizes the danger we're in once we meet the super old president. She's like four times our age. That doesn't stop her from wanting to dress him up, apparently. After all, us children would be much happier if we just listened to adults like her. I witness an extremely rare wormhole, and before figuring out what this jellyfish is or what it wants, I take it out with psychics. That's the only way to treat interdimensional beings. How and I narrowly escape this paradise with our lives and are giving parting gifts in an attempt to make us return. How get some food, and I, one of the most powerful psychic moves in the game. That seems about fair. To celebrate our newfound freedom, How and I have a battle. Nalala gets a crit flame charge to take out Dartrix, baiting out Vaporeon. Oila takes more than I thought from Water Pulse, but risks a crit to use Nasty Plot. He had a Lumberry in case it confused. It doesn't, and so Oila begins to sweep. Vaporeon falls to Electro Ball, Noibat to a Psychic, and Tauros too. Against his own kin, Oila retreats to Popoki, who gets quick attacked a few times, but it does basically nothing. And here I thought How and I would be close after that horrific shared experience, but I guess not. In the only library in all of Alola, Samson Oak tries to lecture me about the regional variant Pokemon, as if I haven't been using them exclusively this entire time. I know more about these things than you ever will, old man. You haven't even seen a Persian yet. What a noob. Before the next trial, the professor points out Mount Lanakila rising above the mist. That's where the very first Alola League is going to be held. And since I'm using Alolan variants, it only makes sense that I should be the first champion. But the first step obviously, is to find some bugs. Right when we need him most, a big fat Tojidomaru jumps from the sky to absorb all of this excess electricity, and then gives me the stink eye as if it were my fault. I didn't do anything. Nalala starts with a bone meringue, and I was totally expecting a spiky shield. Instead, he zip zaps, which does nothing, because I changed her ability to lightning rod. With a thick club, the fat guy barely survives, and then out comes Dedene to lower Nalala's attack. After several charms, I swap into Papoki and almost immediately back to Nalala to reset her attack. 
but it doesn't work because she is double charmed yet again. Okay, fine. Let's bring out Wheela who gets charmed, which is pointless. Nasty plots a spiky shield and takes out the fatter Steelichu with Psychic. I then let Kele come out to finish the battle because why not? That Electrium Z should be pretty useful soon enough. The Professor is ambushed by Team Skull, but rather than fight back himself, he wants me to do it. Lame. Now Guzma's Golisopod is a bit concerning, but his strongest move, first impression, can only be used when he first comes out. So Protect stops all that. Popoki uses a single workup, takes a Sucker Punch, and scares away this bug with a Power Gem. The second bug falls to a 4 times effective Power Gem, and the first one comes back out to also fall. Give me a challenge next time, alright? Popoki had an expert belt there, by the way. This guy has a mental breakdown after losing, so I think he needs some therapy. But what I need is a new Pokemon, in the form of an electric Graveler. Welcome to the team, Pohaku. Old Man Oak is apparently a rad dude who goes surfing just to take a break from research. As a scientist myself, I can confirm that all researchers are in fact surfer bros, just with lab coats. Even though we just got one, let's get another new Pokemon. This time, I'm looking for a cute little Vulpix. But I don't want the first one that comes my way. No siree. To prepare for this long battle, Popoki uses a ton of double teams and has rest to stay healthy. By using an Adrenaline Orb, similar to what I did to get a Light Ball Pikachu, this Vulpix will call its friends. In these games, once you get an SOS chain of 10+, Pokemon start to have their hidden abilities. Now it takes a while, but after massacring some 20 Vulpix, staying healthy with rest and a Shell Bell, the incredible happens. A Snow Warning Vulpix. Thankfully, this is a hidden ability that is immediately obvious. I catch this wonderful creature and name her Elopeke. This gives me a full team of six for the very first time. Yay! Hopefully I don't immediately lose anybody here. For this trial, I break into a Mimikyu's room without knocking and immediately start taking pictures. Yeah, I'd be upset at me too. That's a huge invasion of privacy. This ghost's Omniboost is very concerning, and I don't really like my strategy, but it's the best I could come up with. I lead with Elopeke, who has an Eviolite. She immediately risks a crit here, but survives the hit and sets up an Aurora Veil. Most of my plan here basically boils down to, I hope I don't get crit. Flygon would be ashamed. Anyway, I swap in Nalala on another play rough, who avoids the burn, takes a Shadow Claw, breaks the disguise with Bulldoze, and should survive the faint attack, unless it's a crit. Well that sucks. Alolan Marowak is such an awesome Pokemon too. He did have an Agua Berry to heal, but he went from like 30 HP to zero, so it never activated. Oh, by the way, because of his Vulpix escapades, Popoki is above the level cap, so I can't use him. Also, I decided to just go ahead and evolve Pohaku. I normally wait until level 37 for trade evolutions, but I knew this fight was going to be rough. There is another crit here, but this time by my guy's Gyro Ball. Sweet. Baynet tries to burn him, but he has a Lumberry. After another turn of that, he takes another hit and Volt switches to bring out Wheela. The Bulldoze from earlier not only broke Mimikyu's disguise, but ensured that Wheela would now outspeed. And at this HP, a Volt switch takes out the Totem. And once again, Kele comes back out to finish the battle. As a side note, I didn't realize how late Grimer evolved. I assumed it was in the late 20s or early 30s, but no, I'm still stuck with a small slime ball. Flying high on my victory, Acerola brings me down to earth by making fun of my now ghostless team. Why you gotta be so rude? And so, the time has come to put Nalala into the box with the other useless Pokemon. But this one really stings. Much like some cultures who bury people with their favorite objects to have in the afterlife, I decide to give Nalala the bone of her deceased mother. At least they can now be together again. But don't be too sad for this loss, because in the box just over, I happen to have an Alolan Sandshrew named Amakila. This girl is the only Alolan variant not catchable in Ultra Sun, and I felt like this run would be incomplete if I didn't use all of the variants. I did also decide to use her hidden ability, Slush Run, because why not? I could have gotten it in the same way I did with Vulpix, just in Ultra Moon. Once again, I see the power of a trial captain who has so much authority that they can get a small fence removed. Before entering the desert, a lady offers me a choice between fresh water and not fresh water? Yeah, because I'm gonna drink some old water? Come on. There is a Plumeria fight here, but Pohaku takes out both her Pokemon no problem. After that, I meet Grimsley, 
a makeup wearing guy who looks more out of place on a beach than even Joe Biden. And that's saying something. On my way to Team Skull's hideout, I enter this innocent looking house, and that's a lot of cats. I mean, I like Popoki, sure, but one is enough for me. At this point, Kelly reaches level 38 and finally does evolve. That is so much later than I realized. Kelly was really useful at the start of the game, but has kind of fallen off since then. Hopefully this stat boost will make him helpful once again. I infiltrate Poe Town, Team Skull's not-so-secret hideout, by walking directly in through the front door, encountering yet another barricade. But this time, I don't have the authority of a trial captain, so I guess it's game over. There is no way I can climb over this fence. It's like four feet tall. Or I could just go around it. By the hotel pool, I find a very useful item, an ice stone. The only problem is, two of my guys need this to evolve. After some debate, I decide to evolve Amakila, the Sand Shrew. Having a strong defensive steel type should be pretty useful. But also, if I don't evolve Vulpix yet, maybe I'll keep her in the back for a while, where she's less likely to die. Apparently, I'm here to save some young goose who looks so mean. I don't know why you'd want him back. Either way, this Guzma fight is basically the same as the last one. Popoki protects against first impression and is able to use two workups for free. That was awfully nice. At this point, it's a power gem sweep. Glycopod does survive the first hit, but not Masquerade. Glycopod comes back out and is once again power gemmed. Completely this time. Pinsir requires a Continental Crush Z-move and never stood a chance. Once again, it's obvious that this guy needs some professional help. After rescuing this scary looking Pokemon, I immediately search through Guzma's treasures to get Bugni MZ. But without watching someone dance, how will I be able to use this? I return to Aether House to find out that Lily and Cosmog have been Pokenapped. This upsets Gladion so much that he fights me, even though I had nothing to do with it. I start with Alopeke to set up the snow and pivot to Amakila, who this Golbat can't really hurt. After a bit of dancing with swords, Golbat falls in one Icicle Spear hit. That was kinda pathetic. Fake type Null is iron headed, and the real one survives the hit and then falls to snow. That was a bit easier than last time. Before going to rescue Lily, Nanu shows up to make sure I'm strong enough to do this. But he's a police officer. Shouldn't he, you know, do his job and rescue the kidnapped girl? Instead, he leaves it to a bunch of 11 year old kids. I can't fault him too much though, because he is the most laid back person in all of Pokemon. He barely even stands for Pokemon battles. Here, I use the exact same strat as before, setting up the snow with Elopeke, swapping to Amakila on a fake out, Swords Dance, and Iron Head to take out Sableye. Leech Life heals her against a Crocorock, but it wasn't necessary because my not at all stolen Bugni MZ turns Leech Life into a one hit KO against the Persian. After wasting a bit of time, Hao appears and wants to join this rescue mission. All right guys, let's do this. During the infiltration, there are so many double battles. It's ridiculous. Especially this one, where I thought it would be cool for Hao and I to both use our Raichus. Keep in mind, we're facing off against water Pokemon. They're literally fish. Oila does what he's supposed to and takes the Huntail right out. Hao's Raichu, however, uses Psychic instead of Thunderbolt. This leaves one fish alive to hit me with a really strong Aqua Tail. I swear, if I had lost Oila here because of Hao's stupidity, I would make his life miserable. I mean, I kind of do in the next fight anyway, by bulldozing his Raichu while completely missing all of my opponents. How you like them apples, man? Apparently, Hao is not pleased with how that battle went, telling me I shouldn't do things to make other people sad. It turns out that Guzma and Team Skull are working for President Lusamine, and I need to go through this guy to get to Lily. But for the third time, it's basically the same exact battle. Though this time, Popoki has an expert belt. After a single nasty plot, all of Guzma's bugs go down to a power gem. These fights are just too easy. After another breakdown, Lusamine drops a bombshell. At least for how, that these three almost identical people are related. Whoever could have guessed? To show that she is strong enough to protect Alola from Ultra Beasts from another dimension, she decides to beat up an 11 year old kid. Which, as we all know, is the epitome of strength. Her Clefable is immediately iron headbutted by Amakila, baiting out a fire punching Lopunny. Or not. I thought Popoki would outspeed, but I was wrong about that too. There are several close calls here. I apparently messed up my calculations because I thought he would be a lot safer. But after healing, 
he does take out Lopunny with a metronome echoed voice. And at this point, it's strong enough to one-shot the rest of her team. I honestly don't know what happened in that battle. All of my calculations and assumptions were apparently completely wrong, but it still somehow worked out. Lusamine gets gracefully sucked into a wormhole as Guzma just yeets himself away. We'll probably never see either of them again. Which is sad, sure, but I have more islands to visit. But first, Lily interrupts my mission to show off her new style. Um, okay, whatever, don't really care. I catch Hapu desecrating some ancient ruins, and on Executor Island, I do the same by taking a 1,000 year old flute. Finders keepers. A freaking giant Executor was somehow hiding in the grass, and just for fun, I use my Master Ball on this weird dragon Pokemon. And that is the last Pokemon I get to catch. All of the Alola variants now belong to me. Instead of wood, this new type of barricade is made of Team Skull members, so it's a bit harder to move. They just don't listen to Kahuna authority. After their defeat, Plumeria asks me to save Guzma, even though he willingly jumped into the wormhole. How is that my problem? I just want to finish up with these trials. Speaking of, Como, oh, almost just squashed me. I lead with a newly evolved Alopeque to use Aurora Veil. She takes a poison jab, and is poisoned, as Noivern comes out. I risk a crit here to take out the bat with Blizzard, survive the hit, and heal. Scizor is obviously too much for my Arctic Fox, so out comes Amakila. After taking some damage, he gets a 4-hit Icicle Spear to knock out the dragon. With him gone, Pohaku can come out to rock slide Scizor a few times. I hurry up these ridiculously long stairs, so Lily and I can get into position to stand around all night long and just wait. Well that seems like a waste of time. When the sun comes up, we play the very old and surely plague infested flutes to awaken Sogaleo. Just in time for Guzma and the Prez to fall out of the sky and Necrozma to absorb the legendary cat we just brought out. That doesn't seem particularly fair now, does it? Jedi Hala senses a disturbance in the force as some ultra beasts decide to attack all of Alola. This one though, doesn't look so scary. Not compared to what Olivia is facing. That guy is terrifying. Just look at those insane biceps. Anyway, Kele makes relatively short work of Necrozma with a few crunches. But it's not even close to over yet, because I need to travel through this wormhole, riding a sun, and invade his home, Ultra Megapolis. Now this fight sucks, because Ultra Necrozma is 10 levels above the level cap and all of his stats are sharply boosted. So there's only one thing I can do, Toxic Stall. Kele survives a Dragon Pulse, thanks to Focus Sash, and thus begins my expert strategy. He stalls with Protect, before swapping to Alopeque on a Dragon Pulse, who starts dealing even more passive damage. She also protects, of course, and as Amakila comes out to tank a Smart Strike, Necrozma is a goner. That fight was way easier than I thought, but I did use up my Focus Sash, so that kinda sucks. It did save the world, so I guess I can live with that. The last trial, by Captain Mina, starts by battling her. Her Mawile intimidates Pohaku and lowers her attack further with a play rough. Fun. A few bulldozes and stealth rocks later, Pohaku is the victor. Niu, the executor, makes his mighty debut to soak up an earthquake, and that's about it. I want Amakila out here to expert belt Ironhead. And the Ribombi too. Good job Niu, you did great. Mina's trial consists of me backtracking all across these islands to refight all these battles I've already fought. Which seems a bit like filler to me, but I do what I'm told. Even if it means starting a fight in a cemetery. Pohaku outspeeds Alima's gumshoes and defeats it in a few brick breaks. Kele takes a Kamala's wood hammer, protects against a Z-move, and still almost falls to a slam. That was way stronger than I thought. Okay, change of plans. Let's swap to Pohaku, pivot to Niu again on a wood hammer, and egg bomb the Kamala. For the Smeargle, Alopeke simply uses a Choice Specs Blizzard to one-shot. Smeargle is no longer that strong. Ilima takes me to the jungle, where I have to face Mallow again. But this time, I have Alopeke with an impossible to miss Blizzard. So yeah, and what happened to Mallow's ultimate star rain attack? Lana, seeing her friend get decimated, decides to not put up a fight and gives me the flower. Kyoe, on the other hand, wants to burn in battle with me. Yikes. Alopeke starts with an Aurora Veil and eats a Shaka Berry to decrease the fire damage. Pohaku gets Flare Blitzed a couple of times, but thankfully is not burnt 
and rock polishes. Arcanine falls to a rock slide, Marowak to a Continental Crush, and Talonflame does outspeed to deal a whopping 14 damage with a quad-resisted Brave Bird. That was pathetic. Of course, I did misclick Rock Polish instead of Rock Slide, so the bird lives another turn. But next turn, he survives again when Rock Slide misses. But the turn after that, Rock Slide does connect, finishing the battle. Sophocles is the last captain I have to battle, and I leave with Pohaku again. He is really stepping up in these last few fights, even if he is immediately flinched. After two Rock Polishes, Pohaku sandstorms on a spiky shield, and bulldozes the Steel Rat. His Golem doesn't know any ground moves, like a loser, so two bulldozes takes him out. Last is Magnezone, but with the special defense boost from Sandstorm, he easily survives a Flash Cannon and defeats Sophocles all on his own. Nice. Before getting the last pedal, Guzma, Howe, and I meet up for a little chat. And by chat, I mean Howe yells at Guzma well after he's out of earshot. Tone it down, man, jeesh. Nanu, in his typical laid-back fashion, just gives me this pedal without a battle. Thanks. Mina creates a rainbow flower from all my hard work that this totem bee wants to steal. It starts with a quiver dance, and is corkscrewed, but survives the hit. Amakila should survive a non-crit, but B gets greedy and uses another quiver dance. Not what I expected, but I'll take it. The Blissey quickly falls too. I may have finished the last trial, but there is still one island kahuna to fight. Hapu. Of course, with a metronome blizzard from Alopeke, I have nothing to worry about. The only Pokemon who survives the hit is Gastrodon, and she does lower accuracy with Muddy Water, but Blizzard bypasses accuracy checks in Hail. Obviously. So yeah, that was super easy. And that's why I spent so much time getting a Snow Warning Vulpix. It's totally worth it. With the last Grand Trial complete, I am able to head to Victory Road, where I'm immediately blocked by Gladion. Thanks to the free Hail, Amakila outspeeds even a Crobat to get a Swords Dance, while taking basically nothing from acrobatics. From there, it's just a sweep with an Icicle Spear, Brick Break, and one overpowered Giga Impacted Breakneck Blitz. That was a mouthful. It was also 100% not necessary, but it was still fun. That'll teach Gladion to stay away from me. At the top of the mountain is Professor Kukui, in his very inappropriate clothing as always. That's a whole lot of midriff there, buddy. He reminisces about losing to Lance in the Kanto Elite Four, which is weird, because I don't typically have fond memories of losing the most important Pokemon battle of my life. But hey, maybe that's just me. Anyway, after some last minute prep and getting Wheela out of the box, we head into the Elite Four. It's time to see if my Alolan variants are truly worthy of being the first champions of the region. You know, the ones who are still alive. I decide to start with a trainer I think will be the easiest, Acerola. And man, these rooms really suck, don't they? Compared to Kalos from the previous generation, these ones are not unique at all. I leave with Kele to crunch the bayonet after getting screeched. This baits out an earthquaking Palosand. Now Kele may be as slow as Sludge, but he's still faster than Dirt. So good for him? With incredible agility, Kele Black Hole eclipses Palosand right into a second grave. Frostlast uses Confuse Ray. I was expecting a Blizzard, but Crunch goes through. Now it's time to swap to Popoki on a slam and take him out with a few Dark Pulses. Now the Drift Blim only has Ominous Wind, which won't do too much, especially when he uses Focus Energy instead. That lets Popoki use one more Dark Pulse for the win. The second easiest member should be Kahili. Uila starts the battle by Thunderbolt in the Braviary and is promptly throat chopped by Howlucha. Um, what? He was totally supposed to be faster. It was his first time out of the box since Executor Island, and this is how he repays me? Well, I use Alopeke to make it hail, and swap to Amakila on a Poison Jab. Unlike some critters, she actually outspeeds and gets a 3-hit Icicle Spear. I'm hopeful that a Metronome Icicle Spear can take out Mandibuzz, but it only hits twice. She gets confused, and Popoki is out once again to take her place with a Power Gem. Now the Toucanon could be an issue, but he chooses to miss a Screech, giving me a free turn. The second Power Gem allows him to heal, and then Popoki gets a much needed crit, taking out this bird without getting hit. The last bird is Oracorio, who is four times weak to rock. So yeah, no problem there. 
It does suck losing a Wheela to a stupid mistake like that, but it shouldn't hurt my chances too much in the next battles, because he was basically just along for this fight. Olivia wants a rematch from last time, so I oblige. I start with Alopeke, and I'm sure you know what's coming next. Amakila. I mean, I could teach her Hail, I guess, but it would just take up a move slot, and I don't want to waste Amakila's held item with an icy rock. Anyway, the Armaldo's four-hit rock blast does concern me, but after a swords dance, he uses X Scissor instead. That was a bit weird. Iron Head takes out the Fossil, and the Lycan Rock too. Probo Pass is a bit of a concern with Earth Power, not that he even used it. But Protect lets the Hail break his sturdy, and a 4 times Drill Run takes him out. Gigalith steals the Hail like a jerk, and survives an Iron Head, also like a jerk. After being slowed down, I get scared and don't want to lose Amakila. In hindsight, I dramatically overestimated Gigalith's speed, but it's better safe than sorry. Alopeke resets the hail, getting rid of the Sandstorm special defense boost, and once again, I rely on Popoki to clean up the battle after I made a mistake. With a nasty plot, Gigalith is knocked out. But I kinda forgot about Cradley. That's fine, Kele should be able to take anything this girl can throw at him. Funny story, I considered replacing Gunk Shot with Poison Jab for the Elite Four, but at the time, the extra power seemed worth the risk. Cue two consecutive Gunk Shot misses. Great. At least the third one poisons, but it still wasn't enough to one-shot. A crunch then does finish it up. That was not so great. I've been saving this battle for last because I'm not super confident in my strategy, but we'll see how it goes. Pohaku starts by bulldozing the Klefki, allowing him to set up two spikes. But that was not the start I anticipated. Because Klefki chose to not hit him, Pohaku stays in on the Doug Trio and survives thanks to Sturdy. Nice! One Bulldoze takes it out. Popoki comes in on a Bullet Punch, and Black Hole eclipses the Metagross. Elopeke comes in to make it hail, and baits out an Iron Head for Amakila. That Air Balloon, by the way, was for swapping into Doug Trio if Pohaku had been hit. But now it's kind of pointless. She uses Swords Dance, dodges Metal Sound, and Drill Runs. Last is Magnezone, whose Sturdy is once again broken by the hail, and falls to another Drill Run. Not being hurt by Klefki at the start made that match way simpler. Now, if you've never played a Pokemon game before, you might think that's the end. But I hate to break it to you, even after defeating the Elite Four and basically becoming the champion, I am forced to fight just to hold on to this title. But when exactly did Hao beat the Elite Four? Or does he just get a pass to make things more interesting? I don't understand this at all. This feels a bit too contrived for me. Whatever. That Crystal Throne doesn't look all that comfortable anyway. Hao taunts me with his still alive Raichu, but only for a bit, as Pohaku bulldozes thanks to Sturdy. Popoki comes out on an Earthquake, stays healthy with Leftovers, and is outsped by this bull. Did not see that coming. At least this time, it doesn't result in a loss, as he survives with 7 whole HP and gets a critical Dark Pulse. Well, that was pure luck. Kele gets hit by Vaporeon's Hydro Pump, and you'll notice he has Poison Jab now. I learned my lesson. Of course, his attack is lowered thanks to Charm. A few hits with Poison Jab and Crunch, and Poison does its job. Crabominable misses an Ice Hammer, and for once, Amakila doesn't even need Hail to outspeed. She could possibly finish this battle on her own, but I decide to give that honor to Alopeke. She can tank anything this bat throws out, and responds with a Blizzard. And the very last Pokemon, Decidueye, never stood a chance. With that, Lilo has effectively shown how powerful the Alolan variants are. But wait, before we finish the video, there are a few things I need to do. First, I am finally acknowledged as the champion level trainer by this Pokemart guy. His approval is the only thing I ever wanted. Then, I let Uila rest in peace in Lonnie, where he belongs. Last, I decide to level up Eli two whole levels so she can evolve. She didn't really do anything here, but maybe if she had survived, she could have been useful. Just look at those gorgeous locks. This is only my second time playing through Alola, and I've gotta say, the idea of having Pokemon evolve differently in separate regions is really awesome. Going into this, I thought that Raichu was going to be much more useful than he ended up being, and I never anticipated Alolan Persian being so helpful. Both of his abilities, Technician and Fur Coat, are superb. He is a solid Pokemon. Aside from him, 
Obviously, Ninetales and Sandslash were solid too. Marowak could have been useful if he had survived. Either way, we made it. Obviously, I'd like to do the same thing in different regions, so let me know which one you want to see first. And if you're able, consider checking out my Patreon or YouTube memberships. It's the best way to support the channel directly. Thank you for watching, and as always, I'll see you in the next region.